Hi everyone, thanks for joining today's webinar on effective paperless validation for regulated companies. Uh, we're just going to give everyone a few more minutes to join and then we'll get started. All right. Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining today's webinar, Effective Paperless Validation for Regulated Companies. Today's speakers include myself and Breen as your host for today. We have Bob, our SVP of Sales and Marketing, to give you a brief overview of modern requirements and ask some polling questions, followed by our special guest speaker today, Renee Van Opstel, the owner and consultant at Van Opstel Consulting. Renee has been helping clients across Europe with his validation services for decades now and recently discovered modern requirements earlier this year when he quickly realized that it could really save his clients a lot of time and improve quality. He shared his validation approach with us at Modern Requirements and became a very trusted business partner and was able to configure the tool to support his services. Most recently, he authored a white paper on validation with modern requirements for DevOps, which is uh, available upon request and will be available on our website shortly as well. We are very excited that Renee is joining us and really making this practical approach to paperless validation available to uh, all of our webinar participants today. Uh, so please stay tuned to hear more on that. And we also have Asif Sharif, our chief technologist, who is on the line to support with the Q&A portion of today's call. Uh, before we begin, just a few housekeeping items. If you've been here before, you know the drill, but uh, we always send out the recording of our webinars afterwards. So if you can't stay for the full hour or you just want to share it with your team afterwards, uh, you will have it in your inbox by the end of the week. And they will also be available on our website along with all of our other webinars. We will have about 15 minutes towards the end reserved for Q&A, so feel free to drop your questions in the control panel at any time. And um, we also have a feedback survey that will pop up in your browser as soon as the webinar is complete. So if you have a moment or two, um, please complete the survey. It really helps us understand 
what topics are of interest and how we can improve our webinars for next year. And lastly, if you're not a current customer of Modern Requirements, you can visit the link on the screen uh, to get your free 30-day trial of Modern Requirements. Or you can visit our website and just hit the button on the top right corner to uh, start your free trial. It's a really great way to you know, try it out, see if it's the right fit for your team. Um, throughout this webinar, you will get a better sense of uh, the many features and capabilities of Modern Requirements for DevOps. So if that has piqued your interest at all, please uh, visit the link on the screen to start your free trial. All right, over to you, Bob. Thanks, Ambreen, and good day, everyone. I see a lot of very familiar names and the attendees, and uh, welcome. So many of our clients ask us today if our software is validated, and that's, of course, uh, in companies in regulated industries. So what does this really mean to validate the software? According to the, the Food and Drug Administration, uh, it's really providing objective evidence that the products you're building conform to user needs and intended uses. And our software has been validated by many, many times by our clients against their standard operating procedures to prove traceability uh, to the released version of the product and the re associated requirements. More specifically, when you're testing software, um, there's a list of requirements uh, that address various aspects of your product, and I've listed some of the key ones here, um, and all of these are generally included in the scope of your validation. But today, when we speak to our regulated uh, clients, uh, we find that many of them, uh, when they engage with us, are using Microsoft Office tools like Excel uh, to validate their systems and some type of external approval system uh, to provide evidence that the requirements were approved. Um, these approaches are time consuming. Uh, they don't provide the end-to-end -end traceability. Uh, managing changes uh, are difficult. And uh, these factors often cause product releases uh, to be delayed. So modern requirements um, for DevOps is a web-based application uh, that provides users with a single source of truth for all requirements, tests, and approvals all in Azure DevOps. It can be installed on premise or it can be accessed in the cloud. And it has been deployed by scores of regulated life science and medical device companies, including uh, companies like Becton Dickinson, Siemens Health and Ears, Philips Healthcare, and many pharma companies globally. The tool provides many layers of functionality to help clients create a repeatable requirements process. And the auditability layer uh, really provides that validation information to simplify the validation process and automate it to be paperless, as Renee will outline shortly. Our clients have proudly reported many quantifiable benefits that they have realized in implementing our tool. From productivity improvement in defining requirements to much faster compliance reporting, our product has helped clients get their products to market more quickly and with higher quality. Today's webinar 
focuses on the needs of compliance managers with paperless validation. However, as the tool has won awards based on the breadth and depth of the capabilities that it provides, value can be realized by many different stakeholders in your product life cycle. And some of those points of value are highlighted on this slide. So I will now get into some of the polling questions because it's very helpful for us to understand our audience. Um, so let me, we have four polling questions that we'd appreciate if you could answer. So we'll give you about uh, 10 seconds or so um, whether tools other than Office are used. And if you do use tools other than Office, uh, could you enter which tools they may be uh, in the, the question box, please? We have about 60%, 65% of the people who have voted so far. Now it's over 70, thank you. And most so far, it's about split a little bit more towards Microsoft Office tools uh, than other tools. So thank you for that. So the, the end result with 80% 80 80 of the participants voting, 55% uh, said they used Office and 45% said they use another tool. The second poll question is, um, does your company management view validation uh, as a critical activity today? We've reached 80% response and 77% of you say yes, management uh, does view it as a critical activity. So thank you. And that's kind of the expected answer. The next poll question is uh, over the last five years, has your company delayed the introduction of a product because of a failed validation? And these results, again, are not uh, terribly surprising. Um, over half of the people said, yes, products have been delayed. In fact, 60% said yes, and now 39% have said no. Uh, so certainly product delays uh, are a real issue um, and something that compliance managers need to, to deal with. And then finally, the last poll question uh, was, have you validated uh, modern requirements for DevOps? And slightly over half haven't used the tool yet. Um, about 20% have validated it and 31% have not yet validated it. So I will close the polling questions. Thank you very much for your responses. And uh, that's helpful information uh, to understand some of the issues that um, our clients are dealing with. So at this point, I will uh, turn this over to uh, Renee, 
and um, he can share his presentation and go through it with you. Yes, thank you, uh, Bob and, and Brain, for the nice uh, introduction and for the opportunity to speak about uh, my experience in, in using uh, this wonderful tool. I think we may have lost you there, Renee. Seems like you're on mute, maybe. Yeah. So, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so, my name is Renee Bobstar. I'm working as an independent uh, consultant in the area of uh, IT and process automation, and also uh, working on computer validation for about 60, 70% of my time. So all my work is uh, within uh, pharmaceutical companies uh, that can be production companies, but also wholesalers, uh, pharmacies, hospitals, and all kind of uh, medical companies that have to do something with, with medicines. Um, in my in my free time, uh, I also work a lot for for ISPE, which is uh, if you don't know the uh, the organization that uh, that uh, releases the camp, uh, which is a kind of a bible within the, the validation world. So a lot of the things I I will speak about also come from this uh, camp uh, guideline. Uh, what I will speak about in this presentation. As uh, Bob was already telling, I have uh, created a kind of a white paper. And this white paper has uh, contains a lot of experience I have built up with, with using the tool. Um, so what I will explain also in the white paper, but also in this presentation, I explain a little bit about uh, how, how to set up the tool. Uh, and how to use it. So I will start a bit about uh, the template that's mainly configuring the tool to use it. Then I will show you how I use my, my risk management, uh, in this case, a uh, functional risk management. I will elaborate a little bit on the approval process. Uh, I will show you how to create uh, documents in, in the best way. And I'll show you a little bit about uh, protocols and testing uh, using this tool. Uh, face analysis is very simple, so I, I only show that, but I don't have to explain that. That's, that's, the, that's the main thing that the tool is, uh, is organizing for you. And the last uh, uh, slide, and that is uh, referring to one of the, the polled questions, uh, is if we need to do validation on, on the tool itself. <clears throat> so when I uh, when I was working in validation, especially in this uh, in this pandemic situation, you try to do a lot of uh, remote work, and when you work with with, with digital components. It's much easier. You don't have to travel to the customers, and it makes the the, the work of validation much simpler. Um, a, a year ago, I had this, uh, the same kind of validation approach, but more paper based. Uh, but yeah, when you want to have a uh, protocol signed, uh, you do that uh, from remote. You have to make uh, copies of the documents, you create signatures, you, you, you sign them, you send them around, and you end up with, uh, with 10 uh, pages of the same uh, copy of the signature page. So that was not very convenient. 
Uh, in the same way, a lot of uh, companies were, especially when they are working and developing software, they already work with all kind of tools like like DevOps and Confluence. But the, the main issue I found with these type of tools is that the, the, the good thing is that they are very open, uh, but that's from a QA point of view, not always uh, very nice. So everybody could change everything. Uh, the versions were were controlled by the system, but everybody could change everything. And yeah, when it comes to signature, you basically need to, to export all the information, uh, get it digitally signed with the tool, or use this uh, stupid uh, copying and scanning and sending around again. Um, so that was quite uh, quite an issue. So I was very uh, very happy when I discovered this uh, modern requirements tool, because um, that could solve potentially a lot of these uh, issues. Uh, I was very impressed by a webinar, but when I started with the the demo license, then I suddenly was a bit less. Uh, uh, happy anymore because the tool offers you so many options and uh, a lot of features, but yeah, you, you don't not really know where to start. So that is where my uh, uh, my, my traveling started uh, within this tool. And to to give it a good start, I started uh, mainly from. Uh, from a, a case, uh, a simple case of a configurable uh, software system for the camp experts it was the uh, software category four. So uh, commercial off the shelf system, a little bit simple, uh, but that was, uh, yeah, that, that was a good way for me to start it. And I just uh, picked from another project, uh, a paper-based uh, validation plan with uh, this approach. So you start with uh, process description and validation plan. From that, you develop a URS. Uh, from there, you have the specifications. Um, and at the end, you configure your system. And when the configure is ready, you start with uh, uh, installation, operational, and performance qualification. And you end up with uh, a summary report. And during that route, you develop your traceability metrics. So this is, of course, a, a waterfall type of validation approach. And that was also used in this paper-based system. But also using this tool, the, uh, the agile way of validating is much easier to do because you can build in smaller steps, uh, make multiple test scenarios that you can execute on, on different moments. And everything is uh, traced by the tool and visible in your traceability metrics. So in the, the last projects I, I worked on, uh, we worked in several waves uh, in an agile way so that the most of the test cases except for the performance uh, qualification was was done multiple times on different parts of the project and also during the project it's very easy to develop your user requirement specification during the project you end up with with multiple values but they're all linked together and all traced and have proper version control so by using this approach, I started uh, to do the, develop my strategy uh, using this tool. And of course, in the beginning, that, that, that took some time. But now I'm working with, the, with this approach on, on, on the fourth or fifth project already. Uh, then you really start winning time because you have done all the thinking up front. And you can reuse all the different uh, the different templates that you that you develop over and over again. So at the first project, uh, I think I, I did not win much time by using the tool. But on the other hand, when you're finished with the validation, you have everything in control and everything linked together. So to maintain the validation and to handle changes is then much more easy. And there is where you win the, the most of the time with the first project. 
but with the second and third and the following project, you win so much more time because all the, the templates are available and you can reuse requirements and there are many options to improve uh, the efficiency of your validation. So, uh, as I was already telling, uh, the first thing you have to you have to set up the tool to work for you. Uh, and that starts with uh, the template uh, creation in uh, in DevOps. So the tool is is fully integrated with DevOps. So some of the things you have to do in, just in DevOps and other things you have uh, to do with tools that you get in addition uh, in your DevOps environment from the modern requirements tool. So the most important thing is to think uh, what you're going to do, what, what work items, as they call it in, in DevOps, what, what kind of umbrellas, you know, what placeholders you use. And what I found out that is the best way and uh, to, to start from is to start with a group of requirements. Like in a normal URS, I created sections with the requirements. And I started uh, in this tool to use the, the, the work item type Epic for that. Um, uh, the second thing is to create your requirements. And in the beginning, I started with using the, the work item type uh, feature because that was already containing most of the properties that, are, that were required. But in, new, in, uh, in other projects, I just created my own uh, work item type and I called it requirements as it uh, should be. So here you see in the examples that I use the feature work item type, but in, the, in my newer project, I always create a new one uh, called requirements. Um, and addition, I also created a mitigation that I will show you later on when I speak about uh, risk uh, assessment. Uh, I created a specific work item type uh, to store the mitigation actions. And from the testing uh, side, I also used uh, test cases. Uh, in the, the latest project, I have used many more uh, work item types because you're also developing your strategy. So nowadays I also use the, 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 uh, the process uh, as a work item and I use the um, uh, process step inside the process as a separate work item. And I also found uh, uh, created documents for specifications uh, to have everything related in one traceability metric. So this is an example of uh, what I uh, created. So if you go to the to the process uh, sheet in uh, in DevOps, uh, you have to create your work items there, and here you see a small overview of the work items that I created or were already in, in DevOps. And when they are already in DevOps, I just added a lot of um, properties to the work items to, to serve my, uh, my strategy. Uh, I focused in this uh, sheet on the properties that I added for um, uh, for the requirement feature uh, called in this uh, version. So if for every work item that you work with, you have to define your own uh, your own properties. Um, and I have uh, showed the most important ones so in my white paper. So here I just only focus on uh, on the URS uh, at first. So we said, okay, we want to have a URS. If you have a URS, you always have a document with tables, with an ID, with a description of the requirement. And also if the requirement is DMP or if you are in a different uh, market, uh, maybe GCP or GLP or whatever, uh, to define if it's relevant or not, because the requirements that are uh, GMP relevant, we need some some heavy validation, 
and for the non-GMP requirements that not uh, yeah that's not required by by the regulations so you can handle them in a different way so this this near this field was not was missing of course in the in the standard feature uh, work item type so I added it and the same was for business priority when you start your URS, you say, okay, these requirements are mandatory, these are optional, or maybe there are a few just for information, and you, you define that in your, in your requirement. Uh, it's very difficult to get the correct requirements, so I just put a few, uh, a few options how to enter those requirements into your uh, into your system. So they have a feature of diagrams in modern requirements where you can do a brainstorm. And the advantage there is when you draw these requirements and you type some text in, they can immediately transfer that into DevOps. So uh, you don't have to do an extra step for that. Uh, in some cases, and especially when you have already uh, paper-based or Excel-based uh, requirements available from other projects, then it's very easy to import the requirements into DevOps. You can do that directly into DevOps, but you can also use the, the document import function of uh, modern requirements. So that really helps uh, to speed up the, the creation of new requirement specifications. Uh, here you can see how it looks inside DevOps. So you see here uh, the, the standard uh, layout of a work item type. And I have added um, uh, here the GMP relevance and the business uh, priority. So everything that you need from your normal way of working, you now make available inside your uh, requirement definition. Another thing that's important is to handle and define the states that you want to use um, during, during your validation. So all these work item types uh, do have a state. And these states you have to, yeah, they are a bit weird from a validation point of view. So you have to set them up uh, fitting, fitting your own strategy. And also in the white paper for all the uh, different uh, work item types, I have defined the states and show them uh, there uh, because you can't use them in the process. So whenever you do, an, an, uh, for instance, an approval of a uh, requirement in your requirement specification, you can automatically transfer all the, the states to approved. So you can uh, show that again in all the, all the documents and everybody has an overview of where the states are uh, of requirements. And if you are working in agile mode, then you can have the first uh, uh, bulk of requirements in an approved state while you're having other requirements still at the defined state. And that will help you with, with your agile approach and still keep a strict validation uh, approach for that. Um, so here you see how it how these states will look into the DevOps. Uh, this has not really something to do directly with with the modern requirements. This this is a way of how you handle that within DevOps. But at the end, modern requirements and DevOps is is, is one environment. It's not something separate. So you you don't even see uh, the difference if you work in modern requirements tool or within uh, DevOps itself. Uh, another important part of a validation approach is the risk assessment. This is a uh, functional risk assessment where you uh, assess every single um, requirement in your URS. Uh, you do that for two reasons. You want to mitigate uh, all kinds of design uh, risks by uh, maybe changing the design afterwards, but to also use this for a risk-based approach for testing. So high risk uh, requirements, and especially when you into the world of uh, critical thinking, uh, you can say, okay, we can uh, high risk priorities we do with scripted testing, and medium or maybe low risk uh, requirements you do unscripted uh, testing because it's less risky. 
um, and it really saves you a lot of time when you think about a risk-based approach of, of requirement testing. So here I added uh, the work item type uh, mitigation because when you end up with a risk priority of medium or high, you need to think about a mitigation and it can either be changing the design or do a certain way of testing. And you want to link this mitigation action uh, to your requirements because at the end, you need to verify if this mitigation action or has really been taken place uh, and it should be uh, popping up in your um, your traceability matrix. So I created uh, a lot of settings to, uh, to 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 calculate a risk priority. And whenever you have defined the risk and you need the mitigation, you have to reassess the requirement uh, for to calculate a risk priority. Uh, related uh, or, or when the mitigation has been applied. So there, is a, there are a lot of fields that you have to define to implement uh, uh, this, this, this risk assessment uh, in the features, but it really helps when you have done that. Uh, the nice thing about, uh, about uh, modern requirements is that, you, that, the, that the risk priority is calculated. So you can define your own risk calculation in the tool by using uh, a, another tool, Matco, uh, related to that. And this will automatically calculate uh, during your risk assessment the risk priority. So whenever you fill in things like uh, likelihood and detectability, uh, it will automatically calculate the related risk as you have uh, according, and that was my definition, according to this definition uh, copied from CAMP, and that's the way I can use it. But if you want to use another calculation type, it's it's all possible, it's all whatever you want. Uh, a nice thing about, um, about DevOps is that there's a very good link to Excel and, and, and Word and these type of uh, other Microsoft uh, tools. So in the past, we always were working uh, with Microsoft Excel for this uh, risk assessment. But in this way, I still using that because it's a nice interface. Uh, but I only use that as an interface. So whenever uh, the, the risk uh, assessment has, will start, I export the requirements into Excel just by executing a query and export, uh, put the export button and you will have all the requirements with all the open fields in Excel uh, with all the people who are who is doing the, the risk assessment. You can fill in uh, together in the Excel sheet over Microsoft Teams or whatever. You can fill in the, uh, the Excel sheet to it uh, the way you used to do. But whenever you're ready with your uh, uh, with your risk assessment, you just you just publish all the data back into DevOps, so that all the all the information is still available and maintained in uh, in DevOps. Basically, after the risk assessment, you just throw away your Excel because you only use that as a temporary operator interface. Uh, as I said, there are a lot of fields you have to define, and this is the the type of uh, fields that I have defined. So uh, everything that if you are familiar with the risk assessment uh, specified in the GAMP guide, then you see all the uh, the things there, and then you have some nice feature here where you can show uh, nice colors. And so whenever you fill in these, these medium and high uh, values uh, in there, uh, the risk is calculated and it will show up in this, uh, in this color. Uh, this is an, uh, an export uh, in Excel as I'm using during the assessment. So you see here at the top the publish mode. So whenever you fill in the details, you can publish it back into uh, 
uh, into DevOps and within a few seconds, all the data is uh, again available in, in DevOps and you can throw away this Excel uh, sheet. Another thing I struggled in the beginning uh, within the tool is the approval process because there are a lot of uh, things you can do using the tool uh, and everything is recorded and that's of course nice but also in some cases not, some cases not so convenient but you sometimes you end up with version uh, 28 for the first approved uh, version so i developed uh, a little strategy for my own uh, whenever you do a review, you can review the individual requirements. Uh, you send out a review request to everybody who needs uh, to review these requirements. And they can comment on the requirements uh, using, uh, using the tool. Uh, and all the requirements are noted. You can correspond, then, you can correspond with um, with all the people who gave comments, you can uh, you can update the requirements. Everything is stored in the audit trail. Everything is 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 stored with version control, uh, but only only linked to the requirement and not yet to your user requirement specification as a document. So what I did is uh, I did several reviews of the individual requirements and at the end when everything agrees with the, with the requirement then I initiated an approval request from the document so then you go to the, the smart talk uh, user requirement where all the requirements uh, are presented and then you send out the approval request and then you end up with a nice version that is approved at version one. So when you do changes, you repeat this process and only when everybody agrees to the changes, then you send a new approval request and you get version two. So that, it, of course you may have multiple versions, but for me, and it's maybe a bit old fashioned, uh, I, I only want the version eh? Uh, when a document is approved and all the other ones are kind of intermediate versions and I'm not really interested about. But still, you see everything that happened to a requirement in audit trail. Here you see kind of an, uh, an overview of such an approval. So here you see the approval request and in this case it has already been executed and it is just uh, in this demo, it was just uh, approved by myself, but of course you can have many people uh, approving and reviewing uh, the requirements. And uh, since I was developing this, in this case, you see uh, the first approval was uh, was version four. And in my new approach, uh, I only want version one to have their approved. So that was a learning uh, lesson from my side. Uh, of course, you can create documents and you can export them uh, with modern requirements. They have nice uh, smart reports uh, functionality to do that. But you really need to think a bit different than, than in the old fashioned way. Um, in, in this case, the document is not really important, uh, but the requirements are. So the the content of the document is important and is version controlled and the document itself is, is less important. So for me, uh, the smart reports are very nice. Uh, the smart documents are of course important because there you have your version control. But when you want to export the documents, and of course that is, that is needed because in several cases you want to have people who have no access to DevOps or no access to all the requirements, still want to view uh, documents, maybe for reviewing, uh, but also when you have inspections, you are required to export uh, the data to your inspectors. And it also, if you have some approved version of documents somewhere on the SharePoint, just for reference, that makes it very easy uh, uh, to look into. So I use the smart reports uh, very often, but they are not so important for me. They, 
And the first line I write into a document when I export is that these are not the official documents. This is only used uh, for for reference, and the real re the real document is inside uh, DevOps. So it is a really different way of thinking, and it took me some time to to get there. But once you're there, it's amazing. Here you see the smart repo function. So you can very simple define the way you, your report will look. It will take all the information from the smart documents and it will represent it in a way that you like. And it can be, uh, for instance, in a table format as you are used with the user requirement yourself in the, in the past. So here you see the result of a document, and you see here the way this is not a smart report, but this is, I think, uh, um, this is a smart report created in uh, modern requirements, but you, of course, when you export this document into a Word or PDF format, it will add a numbering to it, it will add a table of contents to it, so you cannot see that in, uh, in this view. But what you see here is the way that I used to write my, my in this case, uh, risk assessment uh, report. Uh, you just have all kinds of combinations with with, doc, with, uh, with information, with diagrams, just as a reference. And also with the result um, that you have created by the, by the Excel, but imported back into um, into DevOps, and you see a nice export with all the relevant information in your smart uh, report. And I also have spent some time on, on specifications because you also want to have to link those into your uh, into your uh, traceability metrics. But I have no uh, demonstration of that in this uh, in this uh, presentation. Uh, most time I use the, the document import because uh, design specification in many cases are created by um, uh, by a supplier and not uh, by the customer itself. Uh, so they have in many cases they have a kind of a document that you can import and there you can make the, the references to the uh, for your traceability metrics so that everything is is uh, linked in your traceability metrics from requirement to risk to specification and of course to test plan. Uh, not really an expert in testing uh, within DevOps. I'm not really an expert in DevOps at all. I'm just uh, using it uh, since, uh, since I'm using this tool. So if you want to have uh, detailed information information about testing, uh, you should ask somebody else and not me. Uh, but what I, what I do know is how to use uh, protocols for installation qualification, operational qualification, or performance qualification, or as they call it in uh, Game 5, IV, OV, and PV. Uh, instead of qualification, they use the terminology of verification. but what's in a name that's still the same thing. Um, so what you create inside uh, DevOps is a kind of a test plan. Uh, you create a test plan for an IQ or in, when you work like in my last project with different waves, I have multiple IQ protocols and multiple OQ protocols. Um, but it's easy to, to, do, to define that inside uh, DevOps. But in DevOps, you can make a kind of chapters in your uh, test plans, and they call that suites. But at the end, it comes down to test cases. And the test cases you can easily define again using the modern requirements. So in, in many cases, I start with a diagram um, where I take my use case or just build a test case uh, from scratch or from other projects. And build them in a graphical way. You can export them to the to the test case uh, work item type within uh, within DevOps, and then you can add some information and you can run the, the tool in there, uh, link to screenshots or movies or any other information, 
or you can also link uh, the test cases to, to other tools where, for instance, you can do automatic testing, but I did not apply that myself in this uh, project, so I mainly use the manual testing and it gives a nice uh, facility to, to step through your test to, to say if they pass or fail, link any bugs uh, to it, and put your screenshots uh, on there so you can have them all together. Uh, and of course, link to your requirements. So whenever you will graphically uh, draw a test step, you can, uh, in the drawing, you can immediately link uh, the, the test step to a specific requirement. And there you already have the link that is coming up in your, uh, your traceability metrics again. And this is an uh, example of one of the tests uh, of the test protocols. So this is created by SmartDoc, and on the side you see the graphical uh, representation of the test case. And when you have this test case, you can either easily insert them into your your document. And in this document, you you see the uh, the matrix with all the describe the protocol, but when you execute uh, your test cases, you can also uh, transfer this to a report where you see all the test results. And if you like, you can also have these diagrams uh, showing up in your, in your report. Perhaps I should say you should make them a bit more horizontal because in this way they take up a lot of space. But uh, in other uh, projects, I have uh, worked uh, like that. And then, then comes the real magic. So uh, I know in all my projects, I had to spend a lot of time creating traceability matrices. And for the design part, you have to ask your supplier to fill in his traceability and you have to manage it. And whenever there is a change, you have to uh, update your traceability matrices. That was quite a lot of work. But now it's just uh, define your traceability metrics. So in the in the tool, you can set up uh, the columns that you want to have uh, visible in the in the traceability metrics. They call that an horizontal traceability metrics. So in my example, uh, I usually make two different traceability matrices. One for the design part. So when I do the design qualification. Uh, I just run the traceability metrics for the design part, and you can see that all your requirements are linked to one or more uh, items in the design documents. And at the end of the validation in my summary report, then I do the second uh, traceability metrics. Uh, then I see that all the features that all the requirements that have been defined are linked to mitigations. And you can see that the status of the mitigation, you can see the relation between requirements and test cases, or sometimes also to mitigations. And all the bugs that you have found are linked to requirements. And you can see the status so that they said so that you are ensure that all the bugs uh, have been solved. Uh, apart from this horizontal traceability matrix, they have an option for vertical traceability matrix. Uh, that is, it looks a bit different, but this is more a kind of cross matrix between two, uh, two items, two work item types, or two specific statuses of work item types. And I use that as, uh, in general to, to check the progress. So is everything tested? Is everything designed? Uh, are we ready with the testing? What is the testing stage that really helps to, to find the current status uh, in, with this uh, traceability? So I'm not using them formally, but I mainly use them as a kind of management tool uh, inside my, uh, my projects. And this is an example how to define uh, your traceability metrics. So you just uh, uh, specify the, the, the columns that you want to have there and the different uh, items. And you just push the button and within uh, 20 seconds, your traceability metrics is uh, presented. And yeah, it can be very wide, uh, depending on the amount of columns uh, that you have. Uh, you can also export it to Excel again to have a more 
um, a more smaller view if you like that. Uh, but this is uh, this is amazing, and you see here with all the epics in the, in the first column, all the related requirements, everything that has been designed or um, or tested. Uh, when you like all the bugs, uh, the fall a bit out of the screen right now. All the information is there, and it is there whenever you need it. And uh, yeah, I found that uh, really amazing. So, and coming back to the um, uh, to one of the questions, uh, I initiated this question myself. There's a lot of discussion currently how to deal with these type of tools. Do we really need to validate them? And FDA is publishing a statement about or article about critical thinking, but they are publishing that uh, already for for two years. So. Uh, I'm not sure when they are really uh, finalizing it, but it, if you look at the content, then they say uh, don't don't spend your validation time on validating all kinds of things that are not really important to your patient safety and to their product quality. Uh, if you take a look at modern requirements and also at DevOps. Yeah, if, if there is a mistake in there, no patient is, is harmed. And at the same, the product quality doesn't change by, by uh, the validation tool. Of course, all the testing is important and all the documentation is important, but that is not what I mean with validation. Uh, so my approach, and that is of course depending on your quality system, if this, if this, uh, if this holds, uh, in your in your quality management, uh, but in general, I never do validation on this tool. Um, the only thing I have to do is that you have to show that it's fit for purpose. So it's 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 doing the the, the electronic signature well, and it shows the correct audit trail, and it, it keeps track of the traceability, so that you. You cannot say uh, you don't have to validate, so you do nothing, but you have to do a very limited qualification uh, to, to show that the, the, the tool is fit for use. And what I do in general is I will describe uh, in, a, in a formal document, uh, usually a kind of system description, I describe how the tool is configured and how the tool has been used. So all the steps in this approach, I will explain in this uh, document and also the, the, the configuration of the specific uh, uh, work item types and fields are explained in this specific for, for, each, for each customer. I make this document uh, specifically because it's always a little bit different depending on the validation approach. And another important thing is that you have to ensure that the users are trained so everybody who is using the tool must have enough knowledge uh, that he is properly uh, using this tool because yeah, since the tool has a lot of options, uh, you can all you can also get lost. So you need to uh, create for yourself a very strict uh, validation uh, strategy. And another thing, what is of course important, is that you manage your versions. So each time that modern requirements comes with a new version, you have to take a look at the, at the release notes and you have to verify if modern requirements did a good job on in testing their, uh, their tool. But that is basically what I do um, also in, in all kinds of uh, pharmaceutical companies. But of course, you have to deal with, uh, with the quality system of such a company and some of the, especially the biggest one, they have a very strict uh, policy and, and SLPs on, on these type of tools. But in the uh, smaller companies, the users are a bit more practical and uh, then you can do what is necessary because uh, I still think that validation uh, still has to deal with, uh, with common sense. And, in my validation training, I always have a sentence where I say, when you are validating and you do not know why you are doing it, uh, a specific action, then you probably do it wrong. So always 
start to start with with proper thinking and proper documentation and to not just do things because you have to do it always uh, take a look at the reason for that so that uh, ends my presentation i hope you have enjoyed it and you can use uh, uh, and you can you can benefit from my experience using the tool um, please also take a look at the white paper when it is available um, i think i'll uh, stop now and hand over to probably to bob thank you renee i appreciate um, all of the insights that you've provided to our audience. Um, so at this point, we'd like to get into a little bit of question and answer. Uh, we have officially about two minutes left in the webinar, but we're happy to stay and answer any questions that uh, the audience poses. Um, so if you want to stay, we will stay until we've addressed all of your questions. So feel free to uh, enter the questions uh, in the question uh, panel in the user interface and uh, we will call out the question and then, and then have someone answer it. Um, so the first question that we have uh, is from Chu and he is saying uh, for requirements in a feature work item uh, in subsequent sprints or enhancements, do you update the requirement within the same feature or a new feature needs to be created and submitted as part of the new version of the smart doc? Um, so, Asif, can I ask you to answer that question, please? Yeah. Um, so, certainly, you could do it both ways. Um, you could um, add it to the same feature. Um, so yeah, so, it, it, so there's a few different ways to do it. Uh, you could create a new feature, um, but I personally, I probably wouldn't. Um, I would just add it to the same feature and assign it to the right sprint or iteration that it's gonna be worked on. From a smart doc perspective, you could create another, you could just clone the smart doc or just copy it with the same work items and inject the new work items for that iteration in the new document. So, so it's it's really based on what you're trying to achieve. So there is no simple answer that that solves all the scenarios. But you could create another feature. Uh, you could use the same feature. You can you can create a, a copy of the smart doc. Um, and and add it to it. So th there are a few permutations. I'm not sure if there's a single answer to satisfy everyone. For all yeah, the maybe I can add a little bit from my experience. I, I've also seen both way of working. Uh, personally, I find it very important that you you stick to the same requirements. Um, of course, if if the requirement becomes complex, we we'll have to maybe split it up. But uh, from, an, from a traceability point of view, it's much easier uh, to, to, to keep at the same requirement uh, since the update will go automatically. And I would say also keep the same uh, smart doc, but make a new version out of it. And, and automatically the requirements will be updated. Uh, I also always show the, the revision of a requirement inside my URS so that it's clear that it has been changed. Uh, uh, I, I've seen projects that I've worked with, with uh, creating a new requirement on, uh, on every new change. And at the end, you're totally lost because you, you don't have any feeling uh, what what is the history or what is the current situation? So, from a practical point of view, I would say stay with the same requirement. Great. Well, thank you both. Um, the next question is from Sahil, and he's asking um, for reviews and approvals. Uh, can we lock a work item uh, for editing uh, that is under review? So 
Renee, you want to take a, a shot at that question, please? Saying that's a bit technical. So. <laughs> okay, Archive. Yeah, yeah. So, so work items can be locked um, based on the process template configuration. So, if you set your work items, of course, SmartDoc is a collection of work items. Um, but if you set your work items to um, some state, then then you can write rules to disable all the other fields. Um, this is done in the process template area. You can also specify that only certain people can change the states of a given work item. So it could be locked for everyone else, including the state field, but certain user roles could change the state and then enable the fields if need be. So that's how you could write the rules to control when the work items in uh, review mode, uh, it cannot be changed. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question uh, is from Maria. Do you maintain regression test set? If yes, how do you manage uh, releases for release changes? Asif, do you have an opinion on that? Say that again, Bob. Do you maintain a regression test sets? If yes, how do you manage releases per release change? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a larger ALM question. Um, I mean, internally at Modern Requirements, we do maintain regression test sets. Um, generally, when new capabilities or changes are done, they are manually tested to begin with. And once those features are stabilized, new scripts are written to, to run the regression test on those. So it's really a two-part process we internally follow to, 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 to ultimately end up with, with the automation for regression testing. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so Dieter is asking a question about the process template that was used um, in the demo, and he's asking, why are we showing an agile process? Uh, in DevOps and not CMMI, which already has a requirement work item. So the first thing that I can say is whichever process template or whichever types of work items uh, your business is uh, used to working with, uh, you can configure the process template accordingly and modern requirements inherits whichever process template you want to use. Uh, we have a compliance process template that we have built ourselves that's available on our website that includes work items for uh, design, risks, hazards, FMEA. So you can use that one as well. Uh, but let me turn this over to Renee and ask him why he chose to use the Agile process template in his presentation. Yeah, that, that's a simple answer for that, but it's just my lack of knowledge from DevOps. Uh, I just took one that sounded nice, and uh, uh, for the next one I would chose another one. Uh, but once you have started with it, with the template, uh, it's, it's not easy to, to step over to another one, so you have to do the selection at the beginning, uh, so when I had better knowledge of DevOps, then I would probably have another have made another choice. Okay, thank you. So the next question, uh, I'm hoping I pronounce the name properly, Oded, um, is thanking us for a great session, um, and it then asks the question: as each feature requirement is signed at the item level there is no signature of the entire urs document uh, even signed and if it's signed in bulk the requirements uh, the document doesn't have a unique number from audits the auditor normally asks what is the document number and when was it approved um, asif do you want to answer that one please 
Yeah, so so we do in the audit report, audit report will provide a detailed review of what was approved, what wasn't approved, when it was approved, um, who uh, approved it, what comments were added, um, and so on and so forth. So it's really the audit report that would accompany the document that together would constitute um, the final report. Yes, and there is, and what I usually do, uh, I do approve the whole document. So I do not uh, approve each individual requirement. I do approve the whole document. Uh, as I told in my presentation, I review the requirements individually. Um, but when everything is okay for the reviewers, then I say uh, review or sorry, approve my document, my user requirement specification. And then um, I, the, the requirement specification gets a new version and it shows that it has approved. And as a, one of the features in, um, in, um, the, in the modern requirements is that it will automatically, if you if you want to, uh, sets the requirement to a certain state. And that feature I use. And also at the requirement itself, it adds a comment that, that it is approved. So you only have to approve one document and automatically that is inherited to all the individual requirements. Okay, thanks, Rene. The next question is from Mike, and he's asking, I see you set up several work states, new, defined, approved, etc. Uh, was there a reason you added states to achieve the work item lifecycle instead of using DevOps tags or possibly another way? Uh, yes, um, that, that was also developed during my first project, and I'm still updating it uh, from once in a while. Um, th this is very related to the way you like to work. So um, I'm not I'm not so really a software guy, not really with a software background. Uh, and as I said, I, I do not know uh, DevOps that well, uh, but I do know how to how to validate. And uh, for the validation, uh, I made it. Uh, together with, with the project team, I developed these different states to work to my convenience. Uh, and yeah, you can do it any way you like, but for me, uh, it had to make sense, these different states. And uh, since you you're have different uh, actions on your requirements, so you start with creating the requirements, then you create your URS. But after that, you do your risk assessment. And after your risk assessments, I wanted to use a new state. Uh, so, yeah, but, and also when you complete your, uh, your validation, you want to set everything to as built and things like that. So that, that's why I made my own um, states. Yeah, and I'll just add a bit to it. I think the advantage of using states is you can define transitions between states and who can do those. Uh, and also you can have a predefined list of states uh, which the system will constrain the state to be in. Whereas if you use tags, tags can be anything. You can write pretty much anything. You can have inconsistencies and so on. Um, although you could create a drop down for it, but uh, in most situations, I feel that state is a, is a good one to use. But of course, things rarely are universally true uh, for all situations. But I think state is probably a, a, a good choice in general. Okay, thank you both. Uh, next question is from Dieter, um, and he said he's facing a requirement that it should not be possible to change work items after they have been approved. That's not taken care of in Azure DevOps by itself. How can I address this requirement? Yeah, so this is really, again, the, the answer I gave earlier. 
which is if you you can define the rules um, for work items in the process template editor in Azure DevOps, where you can say when this requirement is say in the approved state that all the other fields are made read only. So people can't change it. And that only certain roles can change the state. So now you start to control when the fields of a work item are editable and who can change it if that's necessary, especially changing the state. So again, look at the process template editor and the rules under work item editing is where you would configure this. And most clients also baseline um, all of the requirements before they are approved. So they know exactly which version of each requirement was approved. Um, and in the review audit report, you see this specific version. So if somebody has changed it, uh, you'll see that you know the version three was approved, but now you're on version seven. So those are a couple of additional thoughts yeah and, and and likewise you can do the same thing in smart doc with versioning okay so it's almost quarter past the hour um, any final questions so I'll pause for 10 seconds if anybody wants to enter anything Okay. Well, thank you all for attending, and we really love this interaction at the end to, to really understand uh, what challenges you're up against. Hopefully, we've answered all of your questions completely and provided you some insights as to how to effectively conduct a paperless validation um, on your systems. Uh, feel free to reach out to us with any additional questions that come to mind. And uh, as Amreen said, the webinar um, recording will be posted to our website and you'll get an email um, stating that. So we look forward to seeing you on future webinars. And again, thank you very much for attending. Have a great afternoon.